I have to say it's quite surreal being back in this the school. Um, so as he said, I, I graduated in 1978, and the building was brand new. So I was among the first batch of students to walk in the doors, and uh, it was. I have to say it was very exciting, and it was a whole new uh, school philosophy, that, and we were part of that big experiment. But I'm not going to go on too much about that because I've got a lot of stuff to cover. But I wanted to um, say, because I think there are a lot of theater students here, that um, when I was in high school, probably like most of you, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was interested in a lot of things. I, English was always one of my main subjects. Um, but so was biology, and so was theater, and I, I think I kept waffling about what I might want to do. When I went to university, I, I did take a lot of English and art and some theater there as well. But it was, I think when I went away to Europe uh, one summer during university years, that I, I, I literally had an epiphany that filmmaking was the best way to combine all these interests, because Film, I, at first I thought I can make films about anything. I can make films about science. I don't have to become a doctor. Or I don't have to go through all these years in chemistry and biology. I can just delve into a subject temporarily and make a film about it. Um, but then I kind of fell into animation at Emily Carr where there was a good course there. And animation, I have to say that uh, theater, my, my experience here in the theater class, we had a teacher named uh, Milk Wright, uh, whom I adored, and we didn't have a, an auditorium then. We used to put plays over in the cafeteria. And uh, there's something about putting on plays and putting on shows that is a, a lot like animation, where I feel like I'm in charge of my own little theater animation, because you have so much control. It's really hard work. and but you get to play in the graphic arts, you get to work with actors. When you make characters move, it's like you are an actor. You can work with music, you can work with choreography, um, editing, everything like that. It's a very complete and satisfying art form. It's, it's magic, really. But it's not for everybody because it's solitary and it requires a huge amount of patience. So, and if you're thinking about it, you know, please come up and talk to me about it. But it, it's fun. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting career because it's always different. Um, do all kinds of projects, which I'll I'll describe some of them to you. So strings. Um, I'll start with that. Uh, strings was a, my first film at the National Film Board that that I mentioned. I moved to Montreal, and. Uh, I'm going, some of you may have seen the film, I think some teachers might have shown it, but all I have time for is to show a short clip, so I'll get that.
Sort of picture froze there. Um, so I'm going to try to describe a little bit that when you're making a film, the creative process is never straightforward. It's never linear. Um, there are many, many things that come into it. Um, I find that I always have, um, I collect images, have images all over the wall in whatever studio I'm working in. Um, read things, watch things, uh, listen to things, and everything filters into ideas. And the idea for strings, uh, a lot of it came from this image, which was by an illustrator named Ronald Searle. And it's, it, this kind of sums it up. It's about uh, living in close quarters in proximity. So living in cities where we live in apartment houses and we are adjacent to our neighbors, either above and below or side by side, and how intimate that relationship is, but yet we can be strangers, and how there is comfort in being strangers. Because if you, if you live in an apartment building and you know everybody in the building, that can be uncomfortable. So it's about that tension that exists as you, as you live close together, and sometimes if, that, if you get to know somebody who lives very close to you, it can be good or bad, it can be too much. So I was always interested in that, having lived in apartments in Vancouver and in Montreal in situations like that. So I set the film up um, kind of in this sort of flat cutout, uh, almost like a dollhouse style, with an upstairs and a downstairs, and how they get to know each other through a, a leak in the plumbing in her bath, and it forces them to meet each other. And it's, there's an ambiguity about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, this is an image, uh, this is Matisse. It's a, uh, the goldfish. That was a, um, an image that struck me. And the, the, male, the man character in the film has pet fish. Uh, or sorry, she has pet fish and he has pet cat. And so the, this sort of just entered into my mind as sort of a stylistic idea. This, believe it or not, is my grandmother. Um, and something about her coat and hat and purse. And I, I didn't even realize it at the time because I sort of found this image later that that character uh, looks a lot like my grandmother. Um, the technique is, is unusual in animation. And there, there's a history at the National Film Board of, of pioneering new techniques in animation. It's kind of what they're famous for. Uh, this isn't a technique I made up, but it's one that um, I adopted because it suited me in a way. But it's it's literally painting on glass. So you have a light a light source underneath a glass table. You put you put sorry wet paint um, onto the glass, and then you repaint the image or move kind of push the the you you repaint a character in a new position and erase where the character was and then you take two frames of film and then you do it again so you're constantly destroying your own artwork as you go when you end up you have no artwork uh, because you've you've destroyed it all in the process so it's it's a technique that's kind of seat of the pants it's kind of a scary thing and once you get your film back you see whether it worked or not and it would have to be some pretty big mistakes for you to redo it. But for somebody who tends towards uh, perfectionism, it's good because it keeps you moving forward and you don't constantly fix everything. You just have to keep moving forward. So it's kind of fun that way. And uh, you just use plain old gouache paint mixed with uh, glycerin to keep it wet, keep it oily and use Q-tips, fingers, it's literally finger painting. Um, so that film was, I think, completed in about 1991, and then a few years later, um, I started this film called When a Day Breaks, 
uh, just a completely different technique. And this I co-directed with Amanda Forbes, and I've made films with her ever since. And um, I'll describe a little bit of that. I'll let you see a clip first. So um, some of you may have seen um, how that one turns out, but the, the pig and the chicken end up colliding um, on, on the way to the grocery store. And um, then the chicken is, um, ends up getting hit by a car. So it sounds like a real downer, but it's not entirely a downer. Um, so um, in a way, uh, when the Day Breaks is an expansion of some of the themes that are in strings. And by that I mean that if you take the idea of living in a building with strangers, um, When the Day Breaks is really about cities and how we are all connected, whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not, that cities are have a physical infrastructure. We have uh, pipes and wires that literally connect us um, but we all live in our individual um, apartments, houses, etc. And uh, sometimes it takes a, an event, like a, somebody, a, a road accident, somebody getting killed, to realize that we are connected and that it's a kind of a loss to a community or to humanity, if you want to look at it that way. So you're probably wondering why there's a, a uh, an illustration about digestion. On the, on the screen, but this is an image that is from a medical guide that my parents had when I was growing up that was, to me, utterly fascinating, because I was always interested in, as I said, biology, but this was a way of, the, this book depicted the systems of the body as mechanical processes, which is kind of bizarre, but, but in a way really fascinating and, in a, and also accurate in terms of how things work, and so it, it, if you can see it, you know, there are little, they're little guys in there working, bringing the food down and shoveling it into the stomach and all that sort of thing. And, and it sort of made me think about um, the body as a mechanical process, but it always, you, the, the flip side of that is thinking about cities as organisms, as, as live things, so that the blood vessels in a body are kind of like the water uh, pipes <clears throat> under the street 
if you ever are on a sidewalk and you see that they're digging up a street and you see the sewer that runs underneath, I always find it a little bit surprising, like, oh my god, I've been, there's actually all these pipes down there that I never thought about. Or when you turn on the water in the kitchen, um, we take it for granted that it's there, but there are all the, there's this whole infrastructure under there that is connected to your neighbor who's turning on his water and it's all from this, the same place. So it's a physical connection. Um, so th these are very rough, very kind of bad drawings in a way, but it, uh, of early uh, brainstorming of the film. So it was kind of the idea of the subway runs underneath the pipes. Um, there's a, a lemon down there because in the film a lemon falls into the sewer grate. Um, the toaster is plugged into a wall socket and, and so each house is kind of like a separate organ within this body which is the which is the city. So that would be like an individual house that is if you're living in it you don't really think about the connections beyond it. Um, so this is when the pig and the chicken collide. So kind of like in strings where there's a leak that causes these two characters to meet. And here it's the, um, the, the pig isn't looking where she's going and just bangs into the, the chicken who's on his way to the, to the store. And um, he then gets uh, run over by a car while she's in the store. And um, she then goes out on the street and, and basically witnesses his whole life strewn out on the road. And this is an image that was on my wall. Like I said, there are always images on the wall of a piece of fruit lying on a, a floor or a road, I don't know what. But there was something about that that struck me as kind of a, an interesting image. And so I um, made it so that a lemon would fall out of his bag and fall into the sewer. Uh, which hints at this kind of structure under the street. Um, this is a rough sketch of the plan. Um, um, I didn't, because I didn't show that scene, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but there's a, a scene where we see the chicken's hat, his glasses, and then it goes into the actual contents of his grocery bag. And um, the contents of the grocery bag are meant to be kind of a biography of who he was. Like you can kind of tell who somebody is by what they buy at the store. Like you look in their cart, you say, "Oh, I think there's kitty litter. They have a cat. They really like cheesies. They, um, you know, they use this brand of toothpaste. All that sort of thing. You can tell a lot about people by what they buy. So this is kind of like that, where the pig sees everything about the, the chicken on the road. And then it gets surreal where she sees his, his bones, not literally, but uh, in her mind. And his nerves and vessels, and then she sees all of his ancestors. Um, so the technique, um, this is not um, the actual one I used, but this is called a video printer. You can hook a video printer up to a, um, a video machine and print out any frame of video that you want. So we would go out and shoot with a video camera and then print out the images that we wanted and, and sort of create the motion out of those images. So we had a friend who put on a beak and would act out the parts of the chicken and then we would abbreviate the motion by sort of um, selecting only a few of the frames to create animation. And then we would, using uh, these tools, oil sticks and these kind of rubber tip paint pushers, we would draw out everything we didn't want in the frame and add in things that we did want. So as you can see, uh, this character, we would then draw in the comb on top, the beak, uh, stuff like that, paint out everything behind. Same with the, um, this was a friend that we suckered into playing the pig. Um, and she would do the uh, actions and then we would paint over it and turn her into a pig. A couple guys we knew, we said, do you want to be weasels? And so they stood on the street corner and we turned them into weasels. I think they look weaselier on the left, actually. <laughs> Uh, we needed an ambulance, so we hung out at the post office till we got just the right shot of a mail truck and then turned that into an ambulance and added some dogs chasing it. 
for the cops, we, uh, there's a sort of an accident scene. We um, we stole a shot from the TV show Law and Order for that. <laughs> they don't know that. Though. Um, so the, anyway, the, the film is, as I said, it, the film board really encouraged unusual techniques. So that kind of painterly technique was extremely laborious, but these images were very, very small. They're usually about four by five inches. And so we painted thousands and thousands of them to create that film, which is doesn't happen anymore with, with uh, computers. But um, Wildlife was the next film, which was also hand-painted, probably the last hand-painted thing we'll ever do, because it just doesn't make sense anymore. But I'm going to show you uh, a clip from that. Wildlife was finished uh, more recently in 2012. So I'll show you a, a clip of that. Dear mother and father, happy news. I have secured for myself 90 acres of prime ranch land, which to my delight has upon it an absolutely wizard ranch house. I'm writing this letter from my veranda, and I'm very pleased with my situation. I believe I may now call myself a rancher. Oh, give me a ranch and a big pair of pants. Give me a Stetson too and let me wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Englishman, they end up out here with a whole lot of dollars and no sense. They're wonderful dancers, but I certainly wouldn't marry one of them. We put a sign in the window. No credit extended to Englishmen. It's our policy. They never pay the bill. Give me the wine of the spaces. I'm just like a prairie flower. Growing wilder every hour. Oh, give me a moon, a prairie moon. And give me a gal. And let me walk, walk, walk. I have one more quick clip here. Here I am lapsing into the wild life of those around me. My hands are tanned, and I'm clean forgetting my manners. Before too long, I shall be as rough as a cowboy, or the wild wolf of the prairie. Okay, so um, this film, uh, also co-directed with um, Amanda Forbes, is a story that came about, uh, part of, I was born in Alberta, uh, as was Amanda, and we both have uh, English grandparents who came here in the early part of the 20th century. And there's a kind of a little known history of Alberta of, um, young Englishmen being s literally sent to the colonies, Australia or Canada, um, other places as well, but m mostly those places, uh, when they were kind of failing at home and had, they were ne'er-do-wells or they were, they were usually rich uh, kids who didn't have any um, land or business uh, to inherit at home. So they were sent to the colonies to kind of make something of themselves. And so, this film is about the collision of the civilization, which is Britain of, the, of that time, and Alberta, which was um, basically a wasteland where there was nothing, nothing there. And um, 
the, the kind of what, what they faced. And so this, this is a, a relative of Amanda's, a young, a young uh, great uncle, I think, who was, who was sent here. And um, so the UK at that time was going through a lot of change, and they thought that Canada would be um, kind of this fabulous place to have a ranch. And they were very, they were very infatuated with the idea of ranching and farming and cowboys and all that sort of thing. And they thought that it would be this bucolic place, but it wasn't. It was extremely harsh. And if anybody's ever spent time in um, like anywhere but Victoria <laughs> in this country, you would know what winters are like and that they're, um, nothing can really prepare you for that. And so it's all about manners and, uh, and how, how all the education and breeding in the world is, com makes absolutely no difference when you're in a place um, trying to survive. So this would have been London at that time. Uh, that, that our character, those men would have left. And this would have been uh, southern Alberta. So it would have been a shock. And that, that would have, uh, that, <laughs> this, this picture always makes us laugh because it doesn't really inspire confidence about where to put your money. <laughs> and this would be the kind of shack that they would find themselves living in, so not really a um, fancy ranch house, but a, a literal shack. But they would bring their gramophones, their, their, their fine clothes, their sporting equipment, and they would play things like polo, or badminton, tennis. Actually, you can see their icicles there while they're trying to play badminton. And they would drink a lot, and they, they basically didn't work because they had an allowance from home and they would pretend they were cowboys and get their photos taken in a photo studio um, and send home and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a cowboy. And then in contrast, I didn't show that clip, but there, there were the Ukrainians or the Germans or the, the Poles who would, um, they knew how to work, so they would come here and they would, they would thrive in contrast to the English boys. So this is, uh, does everybody know who that is? On the left, somebody. Yes. Yeah, Charles Darwin, of course. You know it. Yeah, National History Museum in London, England. That's where that is. Um, Charles Darwin, of course, the theory of evolution. Um, not really a theory, um, but uh, the way things are, I think. But um, so natural selection, survival of the fittest. Charles Darwin was a big deal at this time. This is this is what. Um, a young man such as our character would have been very interested in. They would have um, thought that I, being a British guy, would have uh, I can survive anything because I am the fittest. So it was this sense of superiority. And he would study the flora and fauna on the prairie, like the swamp thistles and all that sort of thing. Um, and then here's a magpie, which are all over Alberta, um, surviving the winter, unlike the character. So, in, ter in terms of technique, so we, again, as I said, it, it, this is all hand-painted, um, which was extremely laborious, and we'll never do it again in, in that way. But what's really nice is we still have all this artwork. So this was all done with gouache um, on paper. Um, this is a, an illustrator named Mara Kalman. Uh, she was a, a big inspiration, this kind of slight folk art look. And we used a, a program, a software called Flash, which you probably all know about, uh, where we would animate in the computer frame by frame, and then we would print out. We put a sign in the sorry. window. No credit extended to Englishmen. It's our policy. They never pay the bill. Okay, so that would be the line drawing that we did in Flash, animated. And then uh, each head would be painted um, separately and then uh, superimposed onto the bodies and we would so we would composite everything in the computer so that was a big help so we didn't have to repaint every body every head we would kind of uh, knit them together after the fact but we would end up with a, all these parts that would be put together on the background which was separate 
So you can see the amount of work just in one head of a Scottish lady. So here's a selection of backgrounds. And some scenes, like the golf ball scene, which you saw, uh, each frame was painted separately, um, background, foreground. Uh, and that gives it a, there's a lot of energy in shots like that that are constantly moving. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let me just keep track of time here. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, so we make our own films when we can, and we're lucky enough to have some funding from the, the National Film Board, but we also do commercials, and it's really interesting to do both, because in films you're doing your own thing and you struggle, uh, it's a lot of angst with getting it right, it's your own idea, all this kind of thing. With commissions, you're, you're trying to satisfy somebody else, and they give you varying degrees of latitude, uh, but you, which can be frustrating and hard, and the schedules are extremely rigorous. You sometimes have two months to finish something that in, if you're doing a film would take much longer than that. And they often want things to be like your films, um, but, but not, so you're kind of copying your own style. But you have the relief of it not being your idea and you're not just trying to please yourself. So um, right after we finished When the Day Breaks, I taught for a couple of years uh, animation at Harvard University, which was, which was really interesting. And because we had just finished this, this uh, kind of bleak painterly technique, we wanted to explore software because um, the computer, the digital revolution was just happening then and we felt we needed to get with it. So the uh, Harvard uh, had this film archive and they wanted a couple of trailers. So we used that as an opportunity to um, explore computer animation. So I'm gonna show you two little trailers. referencing, um, I'm sure you know, uh, you recognize film sprockets when you see them or the gears in a real projector, all that stuff that's now um, extinct technology, but um, th that's what some of those images were referencing and it was a really, it was really fun to do something clean, colorful, no texture, because we were so sick of hand painting. Um, so. The next project, there's Charles Darwin again. Um, Earthlink was a, an internet provider at the time, and they wanted something in the same technique as When the Day Breaks, which kind of made our hearts sink. So we, um, uh, this was a really kind of an awful job in many ways, but I'll show it to you anyway. I find it, it's kind of ugly, but they wanted When the Day Breaks style, except everything's orange. I'll just focus on it. You can wear on for evolution. Or you can make it happen. Buy something online and you transform the way we conduct business. Swap songs with friends and you redefine the meaning of sharing. Get on the net and you change the world. Everything you do affects everything that is. When you choose a way to get there, choose wisely. Okay, this job was a little more fun because they gave us some latitude. They, they said all you have to do is um, the lottery, the money from the lottery goes towards the beautification of Colorado. Uh, so the ad agency said just um, if you want to do something about nature, but you just have to end up with these, I can't remember how many numbers at the end. You'll see what I'm talking about. So this, this was um, kind of fun and we were exploring a new technique and learning software like After Effects, if any of you know that. So this was, we kind of use these as, ex as excuses to learn something.
music, if any of you know jazz, that's Thelonious Monk, which wasn't used in the commercial, but it was used on our guide track, and we prefer it, so we always play it with that. Um, we then did a few ads for United Airlines. By the way, I failed to mention that we, we have a, an agent in Los Angeles who represents us uh, commercially, so that's how we, how we get this work. Uh, which is nice. So it's mostly from the U.S. that we that we get this stuff. So um, this was a big campaign where they wanted one minute ads, which is very long in the commercial world now. And of course, they wanted the when the day breaks style, which um, they said made our hearts sink. Except they wanted it to be with humans rather than animals. And for us, the technique was worked because it was animals. But so we didn't really like that. But um, anyway, here it is. Robert Redford, in case anybody recognizes or even knows who Robert Redford is. But, um, so that was a real exercise in telling a, a sh very short story in very limited time. So to, to tell kind of this whole story of the interview, they wanted it to be an excuse to use a plane and, and air, you know, air travel. This is right after United Airlines had been close to bankruptcy after 9-11. And they put a lot of money into changing their their image. Um, I'm just debating how many to. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that one and go on to the next one. This is quite a different one. that was actually near near bankruptcy, and that was General Motors, and they were trying to uh, convey uh, an image of their green initiatives and be a little bit more um, uh, uh, ways of coping with energy efficiency. So we did a few ads, and this this was really um, a great job because they wanted something, they didn't want the when the day breaks painterly thing, they wanted something super, super simple, which, uh, is m much more fun for us. Oil. It's not going to last forever. But what's the one thing we have tons of? Garbage. So a team of scientists asked, why not turn waste into fuel? So that's exactly what they're doing. We like their ideas so much, we're investing in their company. There's more than one way to the future. That's why, at GM, we're on many roads. Everybody's looking forward to the day when hydrogen-powered cars, cars whose only emission is water, becomes a reality. But for a hundred people, people in our test program, that day is today. And while they drive, we learn. So one day soon, the reality can be available for everyone. There's more than one way to the future. That's why, at GM, we're on many roads. I'm gonna, sk I'm gonna skip that one. Um, here's a little um, animated logo we did for a festival in Calgary. That 
was a fun job. <laughs> Um, okay, we're, this is the last, um, Suntory Water, we, we've been working with this Japanese bottled water company for the last five years, and it's, um, it's hell on earth, I can tell you, uh, talk about lost in translation. Um, they wanted the wildlife technique, but it doesn't really look much like wildlife, but I'm going to show you two of these, just, um, they're extremely micromanaged by this director in Japan, but they're, they're kind of interesting. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. アメクイズ今日の雨は何年後に美味しい水になるでしょう。20年でしょう。その話100万回くらいしてるやん。20年後。ギフト。サントリー天然水。Um, I'm gonna I think I have one more. No, I'm not gonna show you that. I'm gonna show you this one. <laughs> so when they asked, they said, we would like your character from Wildlife to be on a Segway with a bottle of water in his pants. That was the, uh, the brief. So anyway, we do what we're told. <laughs> um, okay, that's it. I skipped a few things because I wanted to, if there's time, a couple minutes for questions. I'm very happy to answer them. I went really fast. Um, there's a lot more I can talk about in terms of stories and techniques, but um, if anybody, if, if there is time, I think we have a couple minutes, but if anybody has anything to ask, I'm happy to answer. Oh, somebody must. What was your art like, art class like here at Spectrum? Uh, oh, that's a um, do you know what? I hardly took art here. In fact, I was thinking about, I think I took, um, one with uh, Jennifer McIntyre, but it was a very, I think one semester, um, if I had ever, if I had even the notion I was going to go into animation, I would of course taken Harry Stanbridge's class because he was teaching animation. I think they were doing a lot of clay, but I, I wasn't thinking animation at all then, so I, um, and I, I had already, my family was, a, doing a lot of art, I sort of thought I was probably going to be a writer or something like that. So I didn't really take it that seriously, and I took biology, and theater was more my focus. So um, I did, when I, when I got to university and art school, then I, I got more immersed in it, but I wasn't really thinking, even though I think the yearbook said I was, thought I was going to go into art, but I don't know why. There was too much, there was too much to take at Spectrum. I, it was hard to uh, find the time for everything. So, yeah. Well, um, I just finished uh, a couple of uh, things for kids, um, some little animated rhymes. Uh, we got a grant to do, we were, we were trying to do some kids things. Um, so just finished uh, your little 30 second pieces that we're hoping to um, put on, get on the web or um, sort of sell as a series. We're starting another film board film uh, very shortly, and we might do another Suntory ad uh, this winter. But we'll see. So we're we're always kind of juggling different things, but there there are lots of things on the go, which is good. Yes. Where do you upload your videos to? Oh, um, actually, there's a. Uh, a website, uh, have a website called tillbeforebus.com and um, from there you get links to YouTube and the, some of them might be linked to the NFB site um, and you can see commercials there as well. So if you remember uh, tillbeforebus.com um, or I can, I have, probably have some cards with me I could give you as well. Up there, yes? Um, or, oh, two of them. I guess you first. Okay. Um, 
which filmmakers um, do you think have inspired you most, or do you have any that really have inspired you? Which filmmakers inspired yeah. me? Um, lots. Um, there's a Russian animator named Yuri Norshtein. If you don't know his work, you should. It's just a brilliant um, cutout animation. There's one called Hedgehog in the Fog. Doesn't look like anything we do, but it's he's very inspiring. There was there's a filmmaker who used to be at the film board named Caroline Leaf, um, who did paint on glass animation. But a lot of the times, you know, uh, the inspiration comes from. You might be watching a feature film, and there's a a, a moment, uh, an editing moment. That, um, I mean, as you might have seen, um, I really like very sort of subtle things. I like working with sound. I like creating kind of tensions or um, subtle things mixed with big things that happen. And th that, that kind of thing comes from just watching movies or reading fiction. I mean, animation is a lot like short stories versus novels that you have to be very economical with what you show because it's so labor intensive. You don't want to show stuff that doesn't tell you something about either the characters or the story. So everything is there for a reason. And you can get that economy from reading short stories. But there are, yeah, I think it's just like little visual moments. Sometimes you can be sitting on a bus or a subway and see something happening and you, you know, write it down or it, that it's, um, it, so it's not like any, I can't think of uh, live action filmmakers right now, but sometimes even in lousy movies you find great moments. Because what we do are more about small things than um, huge plots. They're not uh, intricate stories in that way. Uh, your, can I call the commissions? Sure. Okay. Partial commissions. <laughs> it's, my question is, is it like a livable income? I mean, do you, is this like a more of a hobby and you have That's a, a good question. different job? Yeah. Like a stable? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's, it's always, a, I think, an accomplishment to make a living in the arts at all, which is, um, but yes, uh, I think that uh, like at the National Film Board, it's it's not like it's a constant. We've done these very intermittently, and they take a long time. The wildlife was made over a span of seven years, but we did other we did commercials during that time. So the commercials definitely help. They pay better than anything else. Uh, so it's really nice to have a foot in in both worlds. I can't say that it's a Super fantastic living, but it's, um, um, I consider um, myself really lucky to be able to do commercials, and that 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 is changing too because the web has changed everything. TV commercials don't exist anymore, and TV commercials pay a lot better than anything on the on the web. So, but but having said that, animation and media in general, if you're interested in media. I mean, the world is media. The internet, there are many more opportunities, whether it's on uh, websites, uh, all that. Just that whole universe has opened up a world for graphic arts, and especially moving graphic arts. So when I was in art school, or your age, I mean, the only, you know, it was short films was kind of the only thing, or maybe TV commercials. Now it's kind of, I think the world is much greater in terms of opportunities, it doesn't probably pay as well, but uh, but you can do it. I mean, you just have to want to do it, and you'll figure it out. You know, don't don't not go into it because you're worried about money. Thank you. Okay. Yes, right there. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I believe that was actually the security in the airport. Rather yeah. Than no. Well. Yeah. I don't think we can necessarily blame United Airlines on that, but um, um, I'm not a big fan of United Airlines to tell you the truth. But um, we really like the ad agency we work with. But the, we were we were delayed once and stuck in the Denver airport for about eight hours, and at, at a certain point, because uh, we, we, we couldn't make the connection and we went up to the counter and said, does it make any difference that we did three ads for you? Could we get on the next flight? And they said, no. <laughs> but um, 
Um, they're, all the airlines are evil, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I thought I saw another hand. <laughs> oh, yep. Um, sorry, sorry, who's talking? I can't see. Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry, say it again. In the Japanese one. Oh, uh, I can remember. Um, he is it's nothing important. <laughs> <laughs> Just something about sparkling water and it's a, a gift and it's a, I can't write. I can't remember, but um, sorry, <laughs> I don't remember. They were all different, so and I don't I don't really understand Japanese. Um, somebody else. Well, okay, was it hard to make a name for myself? I think that I had some, definitely some luck. When I went to art school, my student film, which I didn't show, um, was noticed by the NFB in Montreal, so I had an opportunity to move to Montreal and make uh, films there. Um, I think the, the, there was less, um, fewer people were making short films at that time, so it was definitely, if you made a film board film, it got noticed. Film board still uh, gets noticed. The film board is, you may not know this, but Canada is, um, if you travel internationally to animation festivals, which I do quite a bit, people are in awe of Canada, and, and they're in awe of Canada because of the NFB. And the reason that is is because the NFB is publicly funded and they get to, we get to experiment, um, so which allows sort of more interesting experimental films to be made. So my first film at the Film Board was nominated for a, an Oscar, and that really helped. So that, that sort of puts you on the map in a way, and people notice you, um, and then that sort of gives you commercial opportunities and that sort of thing. So I mean, if there was one thing I could tell you is if you do go to university or art school and you're interested in the arts, use your, use your school time, whether it's at Emily Carr or somewhere else, and make something good. Like, make, like maybe like finish something. A lot of pe people now, I've talked to Emily Carr, they, they sort of work on a reel or something, but they don't make a film. And I think you need to make a film or make a piece that will be your calling card. School's the best time to do that, you know, because you're you're paying to be there anyway. You have all the resources, all the equipment. Make something that will speak for you, and that because that's what worked for me, definitely. Um, take advantage of your school time, and that's the best place to, to make something. I mean, now with the digital world, you can make things at home. You don't need cameras and all that. But it's hard. I think you need the peer pressure, the teachers, all that sort of thing. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Up there? What, uh, what software are you currently using? Um, a lot of After Effects, Photoshop. The Japanese commercials were all rendered in Photoshop, so no real paint at all. Um, and so the the... The digital painting has really come a long way and it's almost caught up with real painting. But the ease of doing it in the computer is much greater, but it's not as fun as real painting, so we miss that. But it, it's really, it makes no sense to paint for real, particularly commercially, because it's so time consuming. So we use that, we, we still use a version of Flash that's um, in Adobe, it's called Animate. Um, but things like Toon Boom or uh, TV Paint are really good programs that a lot of animators use. Um, and, and then editing in Premiere, also in Adobe, uh, Adobe software. So we, we flip back and forth with all this software and it's hard you know, to be um, the age that I am now, it's really important to keep current with um, software, but there are, I mean, people like you will, or 
come out of schools knowing technical things, they're already way ahead of us. So it's always a um, hard to keep. It's hard for us to keep up because it's not our native language as it is for you guys. And you guys are. Um, but I, I like it. I mean, I like the, the, the digital world is interesting. What it allows you to do. It's, um, but it's hard to keep current. But. So yeah, the Adobe stuff is great. It's, yeah. Probably wildlife seven years. But as I said, I was doing lots of other things. But it, it's hard to have something like that in your life for that long because when you start it, you think of it as one thing, and by the end, you're so sick of it, and you've moved on mentally to other things you want to be. And then, you, and also when you take time off to do a commercial, you come back and then you think, "This is crap. What we've been doing. Let's start over." And you, you, and then you learn something new from a commercial, so you want to redo what you've done, and it's very hard. So we've kind of vowed to try to do things much more quickly. We're trying to not belabor things, and computers have helped that because, as I said, wildlife is all hand painted. But um, yeah, so seven years, I guess, would be the. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Is that a trick question? Uh, I don't know. Could you identify one in there? In what you saw? Well, it's funny. I think you'd, I would probably say, if I was to pick something, which is impossible to pick one, I would say it's kind of an aqua blue, sky blue almost, or a, so it's green and blue. Yeah. Second, second choice would be orange. Yeah. <laughs> What's yours? Blue? Yeah. Okay. Least is purple. Yes. What is that comment here for the next model? How? You know, it's really funny that you asked that because I, I cut out the image that describes that because of all the talks that we've ever done on wildlife where we've shown a lot more slides than you saw, it rarely are we ever asked about the comment. Um, the comment in wildlife, um, I don't know, how many people have seen the whole film of wildlife? Oh, really? Okay, I didn't realize it. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, okay, I'll quickly explain the comment. Uh, when we were talking, researching wildlife, we were looking at what was going on in the world in 1910, and Halley's Comet passed over in 1910. And we started reading about the comet, and they're pretty interesting. Um, and the, the, all of the descriptions that we read about the comet in a way describe our character, but they're kind of, they show up once in a blue moon, they're flashy, they're a spectacle, they, um, they kind of bring, um, they have an, uh, bring an omen, um, good or bad, and there are, there are a lot more comic cards than the ones we just saw today. But, um, so we decided, and it was kind of controversial because somebody, some people told us we should take the comic cards, the written text out, and we almost did. But at the very end of the film, if you remember, uh, he the character goes out in the snow. He's kind of at the end of his rope. He's 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 tired of the of the uh, the country country. It's not at all what he thought it was going to be. But he can't leave, and he's probably drunk. And he takes his bag and he heads out, and then he perishes. So you might think I have a thing about death, but I don't really. But it was more. Um, that when he, we ended with the comet because we sort of introduced the idea of a comet and it's sort of like it's passing over and at the very end we see the comet. And I like to think that he saw the comet uh, at the point of his death and that he kind of joins it and that he, um, it just sort of makes it a slightly more, it's, it's a religious experience and for a character who was actually an atheist because he's a, Dar, a Darwin uh, devotee, believes in evolution and natural selection, 
his religious experience is the comet, and that sort of makes his death um, kind of okay in my mind. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, Wendy was able to come today because the Alumni Association of Spectrum has invited four people who have made names for themselves after leaving school um, to a banquet that we're holding this evening to honor them. And it, another way of honoring them, we're going to put outside along the hall here just before the library, the beginnings of a distinguished alumni wall which will have pictures and descriptions of people who have left this school and in various areas distinguish themselves. And we're doing this because we want to honor these people, and we're doing it because we want to inspire you. You can go from here to a lot of different places. This is the beginning of a journey that can take you to uh, places like where Wendy's like is taking her. So um, in addition to that, we've conned her into coming in here and meeting with you and giving up her time. And I think it's been a fascinating hour, and I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Please give her a big hand. Audience here, you guys are great. Thank you. Thanks.